Well, good morning. I uh, hope you uh, had a wonderful Thanksgiving. You got to spend time with family or friends or neighbors or people that you had the opportunity to, to serve and enjoy. And I do hope that you spent time uh, giving thanks uh, for what God has done for us, for who He is to us. There's much for us to be thankful for. Now, uh, we're in the midst of a series that's titled AMA. It's Ask Me Anything. Uh, these are questions that uh, various church members have submitted. And, and basically what we want to do as, as believers in Jesus Christ, striving to be disciples of His, uh, we, we want to live out our faith realistically in the world in which we live. And, and that's not always easy. And so we do AMAs from time to time to let people ask questions where they might have issues uh, living out their faith in the midst of the world in which we live. Uh, I hope I hope uh, that this is, is something that's very easy for you. The topic we're going to talk about today, I hope that it's not an issue. Uh, things are always smooth sailing uh, in your family or your workplace or wherever you might encounter these issues. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about um, what Christians are to do uh, at the merger between our faith and politics. How are we to be disciples in the midst of this world uh, where maybe this year at Thanksgiving someone broke the cardinal rule of family get-togethers uh, and they brought up politics? And maybe for you it didn't go so well. Maybe uh, you've been in, in the midst of one of these times where an argument breaks out, damage is done, relationships are harmed, maybe even ties are severed. Uh, as believers in Jesus Christ, what are we to do in, in a world where things are changing politically? Uh, things are very charged politically. People want to know where you stand. There's always pressure to bring your voice and to speak up for or against something. How are we as believers to live out our faith in the midst of the world in which we live, where politics is such a central uh, part of life? It's kind of brought to the forefront, even in areas where uh, before uh, you didn't need to know uh, what your favorite movie star believed or how they voted or how they felt about climate change, right? We didn't need to know those things, but today it's at the forefront. And so again, how are we as believers to approach faith? And politics. Now, today, in answering that question, we're actually going to go back to where we were this summer. Uh, we did a series through the Ten Commandments, and so we're going to be in Exodus chapter two, uh, or chapter twenty. I'm sorry, beginning in verses two and three. And I want to begin by reading uh, this for you. This is God speaking to His people. He's actually speaking specifically to Moses on Mount Sinai. But this message comes to us through the words of Scripture. And in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, God said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and you shall have no other gods before me. Now, this is a, a text or a passage that has ramifications for every single area of our lives. If He is God and we're not, then ultimately we should respond in obedience and worship and adoration for Him and not ultimately for ourselves, that we should submit to Him, honor Him, serve Him. Um, but that's especially true or also true in the realm of our political persuasions, uh, our political expressions, how we vote, all of those things. And so um, how do we merge our faith in politics as believers? Uh, the first thing that I want to share with you today is that we should be quick to trust God's Word and quick to be skeptical of our own politics and perspectives. So I'll say it again. We should be quick to trust God's word and also quick to be skeptical of our own politics and opinions or perspectives. Here in Exodus chapter 2, again, we're reminded that He is God and we're not. That God alone is perfect in all of His ways, He is perfect in love perfect in truth. Uh, he's perfectly sovereign over everything uh, that's ever happened in this world. God is sovereign over the events that are uh, going to take place in our, our nation sometime in the future, in the next election cycle, and He's been sovereign over every event that's taken place in our history. He is greater than any other thing. He's all-knowing and He's all-powerful. And so when it comes time for us to approach an election, a political conversation, uh, what we think about the future, we want to be reminded of His sovereign plan for us, of God's ultimate goodness 
Uh, this powerful, this perfect, this all-knowing God uh, is also really, really good. And he's all loving. He's all gracious to us. Um, and because he is God, he is to have first place in our lives. So again, as we approach faith and politics, we're reminded to trust in God and to trust in his word, but to be skeptical of our own perspectives and positions. Now, there is a pattern of Americans, this is particularly bad in our nation, uh, where we're quick to trust our own perspectives. I don't know about you, but I don't hold my opinions for no reason, right? If you want to talk about politics, I think I'm right, all right? That's kind of the way it goes. If I didn't believe I was right, I would have another opinion because I don't like to be wrong. And yet, at the same time, we have to remind ourselves that we're often wrong. We're fallible men and women. And what we may believe down deeply, things that might engage us emotionally, might be totally flawed and wrong. And so as we approach faith and politics, we look to God. We look to His Word to know what is true and what is right and what is good, both for us and ultimately for our nation. We look to God. Now, the interesting thing uh, about this text in Exodus is God mentions here, He is the Lord our God. And he mentions that he had led the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And so the people that he is speaking to here, uh, they've recently come out of a a brutal time of oppressive slavery um, under the pharaohs of Egypt. And they were were worshipped as gods. They were all powerful dictators in their land. The nation of Israel, they were his slaves. They did his bidding. They slept when he told them to sleep. They worked when he told them to work. They were allowed to eat when he told them that they could eat. Their lives were dominated by Pharaoh and his decrees. And yet there was a new Pharaoh that had come into power. And the people of God, the nation of Israel, who didn't have an opportunity to vote, who didn't have a representative that they could call, who didn't have a political process where they could protest and make their voices heard, They did the most important thing, and they prayed. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, we see that during those many days, the king of Egypt died. A new Pharaoh had arisen, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and I want you to hear what God did. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Again, God is not a disengaged God. He's not a God who used to work. He's not some deity out there that's really not all that concerned with us. We serve an all-powerful, all-good God who hears the cries of his people, who sees our situation, who knows Uh, the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And so as we think about politics, as important as elections and politicians and policies may be, we're reminded that they are dwarfed by the power of our great God. God took that Pharaoh, the one who was all-powerful, commanded the armies who had oppressed the nation of Israel, and he brought him to his knees, and he led his people, Israel, he led them out of their slavery in Egypt. They plundered the Egyptians on their way out because God somehow inclined their hearts to give them uh, their most valuable possessions. He led them through the sea on dry land. And then he crushed the armies of Pharaoh behind them beneath that same sea uh, without there being a single battle or a single shot fired. That is our God. And so as believers in Jesus Christ... We're quick to hope in God, not in ourselves and not in a political process, not in certain politicians. We shouldn't worship them. Uh, You know that uh, within the American church, the last presidential election, there were believers on both sides who would say very similar but completely opposite things. There were some people who said, if Donald Trump doesn't get reelected, there's no hope for our nation. Then there were believers on the other side that said, If Donald Trump gets reelected, there is no hope for our nation. And they're both profoundly wrong. Because we don't hope 
in people or politicians or parties or policies. We hope in the Lord our God who can steer the hearts of men any way that he wishes, who is all-powerful and all-sovereign. So we trust in God and we trust in his word. And we view our own perspectives with a degree of skepticism, recognizing that while God is perfect, we are flawed. Um, Anyone else here really thankful that you didn't grow up with a cell phone in your face, like a camera to record uh, all the dumb things that you did? Uh, And and maybe you remember the the really dumb things that you believed when you were 10 or 20 or 30, or if you're older than that, maybe even when you were my age, uh, you believed some crazy things. The truth of it is, we've all done ridiculous things and believe things that now we look and think, what was I thinking? And, and there may be a day that we look back on our lives and some of the firmly held political positions that we have now and think, what was I thinking? Right? I was totally wrong. So again, we look to God, we trust in Him and in His Word, and we view our own perspectives with a degree of skepticism that's necessary for people who are flawed. Hebrews 13.8 reminds us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's unchanging and he's perfect. And so we look to him and not to ourselves. Now that was kind of big picture, broad. How do faith and politics merge? Um, But we need to be more specific. I would be uh, foolish if I didn't, you know, get into the weeds just a little bit. Um, So we trust God's word and we're skeptical of our own politics and perspectives. But the second way that we approach faith and politics as believers who want to engage uh, where we're called to engage or we have the opportunity to do so, uh, but not be overly dependent upon uh, politics and politicians. The second thing that we do is we put our faith first. If God is God... Right? If he is the Lord our God, by virtue of the fact that he's God and we're not, we put him first. He's the one who should call the shots in our life. He, he says there in the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Do you know what causes godly men and women who claim to be followers of Jesus to speak in ways that they didn't intend to speak? And to treat people in ways that they never would have wanted to treat someone, to hurt people that they didn't mean to hurt when it comes to issues of politics. Do you know the primary driver behind that sort of behavior? It's idolatry. It's that we are more beholden to our perspectives or our opinions than we are uh, our pursuit of Jesus Christ that somehow we have confused our role in a given situation that we think we need to to bring someone to persuade on behalf of our political beliefs rather than represent Jesus Christ in the setting in which we find ourselves. Idolatry. It puts something in the place of God in our lives, something else that calls the shots, something else that holds our affection and our attention and our loyalty. And for many believers, you could take the Lord's name in vain, Someone could curse God. Someone could mock God or his word. And we would laugh it off. But let someone challenge our opinions or perspectives. Have them speak negatively about our favorite politician. And suddenly the gloves come off. I would argue that that's idolatry. That rather than seeking to serve and follow Jesus Christ and represent him well. Rather than seeking to build his kingdom. We seek to protect our views and perspectives, and things go awry rather quickly. Uh, A few years ago, this has probably been several years ago, uh, when you get old, it's always a few years ago, Uh, my brother-in-law Justin and I, we we left after church on a a Sunday afternoon, and we were going to take a couple of pigs to get processed in Van Buren, and it was a, a cold Sunday, but it was sunny when we left, and so we take off, truck and a trailer, and we're headed to Van Buren, and as we, as we leave, you know, the weather starts to deteriorate a little bit, and so it starts to spit snow, and you know, it it never gets bad around here, so we're not worried about it, you know. And besides, we're a couple of men. What's well, a little bit of snow? We're not concerned. So we made it to Van Buren. We dropped the pigs off at the processing facility, and we begin to make our way home. And 
you know, the closer we got to Poto, the worse things got, and the roads were, they were coated, and then, you know, snow started to pile up, and things were starting to get slick, and just as we came back into the city of Poto, or we're actually just out here by the Poto River Bridge, there was a, a little bit of an incline that you don't notice when you're driving normally, uh, but it was enough of an incline to slow down the momentum of the truck, uh, but not enough to slow down the momentum of the trailer, and so I remember looking out the passenger side window and watching the, the trailer pass up on the side. And of course, it, it whips beside us and then it, it causes the truck to begin to spin in the middle of the highway, right? And so uh, I'm just hoping no cars are coming. We're spinning in the middle of the highway. And somehow, by the grace of God, uh, the truck came to a stop. Justin and I both look at each other. We're kind of, we're, we're shocked uh, that no one's injured. Uh, we, we were able to get things lined out. The truck and the trailer were a little bit worse for the wear, but by God's grace, um, no one was severely injured. For many of us, as we approach the Christian life, when we allow other things to take first place, it's like trying to put the trailer in front of the truck. And we shouldn't be shocked that before long we find our lives out of control and things are chaotic and they're confusing. He is the Lord our God. He is our source of truth. We look to the Word of God to know what is right and what is true, and we trust Him even when it doesn't make sense to us. We put God first, and when God is first, everything else in our lives can fall neatly into line, right? It works like the truck in front of the trailer, but if we allow other things to be first, our lives are headed for a wreck. And to be honest with you, this is the failure of American Christianity. For many of us, we've allowed our emotions, we've allowed our feelings, we've allowed our own perspectives to somehow dictate what we'll believe to be true about God. The tiny little minuscule creation looks up to God and says, I know better. And we've got to put faith first. We allow God to be God in our lives. And when we do that, man, everything else falls in, into its proper place. Everything else will follow suit when God is first. Can I just challenge you to think for a minute? And is there a view that I'm holding that doesn't line up with the truth of Scripture? I'm not talking about your neighbor's view that doesn't line up with the truth of Scripture or your political opponent's view, but what about your own? Where have you neglected the Word of God in order to hang on to an opinion or perspective that you might have? We are called by God's Word by virtue of the fact that He is God and we're not. But to put our faith in Him first, to let God lead and we follow. We're Christ ambassadors here on this earth. Our mission as a church to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples. We've been called to make disciples here, not to make America great again. We trust in Jesus Christ as our Redeemer, our Savior, our God, not in some politician calling for hope and change. We look to the Lord Jesus and hope in Him. We seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And trust that all of the other things that need to fall into place will fall into place because He is God and He has a sovereign plan for our world. So how do we approach faith in politics? Number one, we trust in God's Word while remaining skeptical of our own perspectives. Number two, we put our faith first. We follow Jesus Christ first and foremost. And then the third thing that we do is we seek to do God's will, God's way. Have you ever been told the truth by somebody uh, in a way that was not at all uh, the way that you needed to hear it? And I'm not saying, you know, some people are a little overly sensitive. Let's be honest, right? They get their feelings hurt too easy. Some people don't want to hear the truth. But have you ever heard truth that you needed to hear, but someone delivered it in such a way that their delivery made it almost unhearable for you? This is often true of believers, we speak the truth, but we've been called to do so in love. And if we speak the truth and we don't do so in love, it never goes well for us. There's a, a story in John chapter 8. And it's a beautiful story about how Jesus is a story of redemption, ultimately. I want to read it for you. It's John chapter 8, beginning in verse 2. It's early in the morning, this is Jesus. He came to the temple 
And all the people came to him, and he sat down and begins to teach them. But he's not just teaching with his words. He's about to teach us with his example. As he sat there teaching the people, the scribes and the Pharisees, they brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. Now, you need to know on the front end, this woman was guilty. She'd been caught. I'm not exactly sure how that went down, uh, you know, but she was clearly caught in the act. She was guilty of committing adultery. Teacher, this woman's been caught in the act. Now, in the law of Moses, Jesus, you know what it says. In the law of Moses, um, we're commanded to stone such women. So what do you say? In verse 6, it says, They said this to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him because they knew Jesus was gracious. And they wanted Jesus to back up their perspective, right? They were literally quoting the Bible uh, that says that you should stone such people, right? So Jesus, give us permission to do the thing that we already want to do. Validate our perspective, right? Get, throw your weight behind us as we uh, stone this woman. And Jesus, he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to him, Let him who is without sin among you, be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. There as he stooped down in the dirt, he was writing with his finger there on the ground. They began to go away one by one, beginning with the older ones, until Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up. He says to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. As Christians, we should seek to do God's will in God's way, in the way that we vote, the ideas that we promote, the perspectives and the parties that we get behind in the way that we speak to and about other people, in the way that we represent their ideas. We should seek to show people that they are loved both by Jesus Christ and us, that we want to make disciples of Jesus Christ and not pawns of our political parties. We seek to do God's will in God's way. Now, there's two ways that we can mess this up. And there's probably more. I'm going to give you two that we can see here in this this story. The first way that we can fail to do God's will in God's way is by condemning sinners. The Pharisees, that was their goal. This woman had committed adultery. Uh, The law is really clear. When you're caught in adultery, you should stone such people. It's cut and dried. Uh, Nothing to worry about here. Jesus, uh, get behind us. You know, like show us, tell us this is what we're supposed to do. Let's, Let's stone this woman. There's a lot of speculation uh, regarding this particular passage, and it's controversial in many ways. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to speculate with you here. So take it for what it's worth. But I believe that as these men came and they pointed to the law, this woman is clearly in the wrong. What she's done is in violation of Scripture. She's clearly a person deserving of judgment. And I can't help but think that as Jesus stooped there and began to write in the dirt on the ground, I can't help but think that he was likely writing other portions of the law that revealed that not just the woman standing before him being accused was a sinner, but the other men there who were accusing were also sinners. That there wasn't just one person deserving of judgment on that day, but rather every person who was standing there listening with an earshot of Jesus was there deserving of judgment. So one of the ways that we mess up as believers in seeking to apply God's word in the world in which we live uh, is to condemn other people. It's to forget that we too are sinners. To forget that what we deserve in our life is judgment. What we deserve is an eternity spent in hell, but what we've received from Jesus Christ is His grace. The beauty of Christianity and the hope of the gospel is that Jesus Christ did not condemn this woman. As a matter of fact, He was on His way to the cross to die that her sins might be forgiven. We are men and women who have totally sinned and we've blown it in every way. We have been deceived 
We've hurt people. We've held wrong perspectives. And what we found in the person of Jesus Christ was God in the flesh who was willing to suffer and to bleed and to die that we might find new life in him. And so if we find that we're quick to condemn, we can find that we're not doing the bidding of Jesus Christ. We're not serving his purposes. We're not doing God's will in God's way. But there's another side of that too. The first way that we can fail to do God's will in God's way is by condemning others. The second way is by condoning sin. And there is a temptation among people who want to appear loving, who want to show the compassion of Jesus Christ, who want to be inclusive of other people, right? Not condemn them. That somehow we ignore their sin. And I'm not sure there's a more hateful thing that you could do to someone than to leave them in the destruction and the, the deadly cycle of sin in which they live. How tragic would it be for us to have the truth and let, let people walk in the darkness? What Jesus did not do for this woman was ignore her sin. He was actually really emphatic. Upon telling her that I don't condemn you, he spoke to her. Neither do I condemn you, but go and from now on sin no more. He called, he identified what she was doing as clearly sinful. If you find that you're unwilling or incapable of identifying sin as sin, um, you have an idol in your life. You're not willing to say about God's word uh, or not willing to say about sin what God's word says about sin. It is sin. It is wrong. We shouldn't walk in those things, right? And if that is you and you, you won't speak the truth to someone, it's idolatry in your heart. You're following something other than God and you should repent. Jesus says, go and sin no more. What we want to do with our lives is, is politics and faith collide. And that's not always pretty. It's not always cut and dry. There are going to be various perspectives that we're going to have. We should seek to represent Jesus Christ well. And above all other things, we should seek to point men and women to Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. And if, you know, the nation, the United States, if it rises or it falls, we remain steadfast in our hope in Jesus Christ. If we suffer or if we prosper or anything in between, our hope is in Jesus Christ. And so as we approach faith and politics, we trust in God, we trust in His Word while being skeptical of our own politics and perspectives. We put our faith first. We follow Jesus Christ even when it might be difficult for us in some way. And then we seek to do God's will in God's way. And wouldn't it be beautiful if over the next few election cycles, no matter how contested they are, if our world and our culture could look to the church and be like, man, there are people in that church that disagree. They don't vote the same way, but, but look how they carry themselves. Look how well they love each other. Look how well they're willing to tolerate other perspectives and opinions. Man, look at the grace of Jesus Christ in their lives. I wonder what's going on in that place that they can disagree so well. It's our responsibility to teach people what it looks like to follow Jesus. And we make disciples not just with our words that we teach, but we make disciples with the lives that we lead. And so I want to challenge you. There's no elections coming up. I'm not trying to sway anybody one way or another. Uh, we're through that for a while. Praise God. But as believers in Jesus Christ, as we look forward, and we'll, may we put our faith first, following after Jesus, trusting in Him and His Word and not our own perspectives and ideas, seeking to do God's will in God's way. Would you bow with me? Father, I'm, I'm thankful to pastor a church that holds your word in high esteem and bows before a holy God that doesn't compromise the truth of Scripture to try to please men. I'm thankful for a church that's loving and gracious and compassionate. But Lord, I want to acknowledge we're not perfect. Maybe even people in this room, maybe it was this weekend or this past week that they crossed the line in the discussion and weren't gracious or kind or, or didn't reflect you well at all. 
Lord, we're thankful for your grace for where we failed, but we're also thankful for your Spirit who empowers us going forward, that we might honor you in every aspect of our lives. And today, most specifically, in the way that we exercise our faith uh, in the political realm. Father, may we be as lights in darkness. May we be beacons of hope and truth, of grace and of life. We praise you in your holy and precious name. Amen.